As quickly as they should be, are they leading to decisive enough action? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and other institutions point out that we only have a limited time span to act. Still, the question of what to do, how to do it in a socially inclusive way, leaving no one behind, is not given the same level of attention and urgency. Last Friday, the Netherlands adopted a national climate agreement containing concrete actions to achieve our national emission reduction targets. And I think you will hear about this more later. For us, coming from a low-lying Delta country, it is self-evident that mitigation and adaptation should go hand in hand. It is no coincidence, coincidence that the Global Commission on Adaptation was launched in our country last year. Climate change won't affect everyone around the world to the same extent poses a much greater challenge to fragile countries already suffering tension or violence. It is in these countries that climate change can act as a threat multiplier by increasing competition of scarce resources such as water or land. Climate change can aggravate existing fragile situations. The nexus between climate and security is complex and multidimensional. The, the challenges transcend national boundaries and disciplines. It requires multiple action and a wide array of interventions. This is why the Netherlands launched the Planetary Security Initiative in 2015, and it has brought together diplomats, development workers, and defense colleagues. Uh, and I think the audience is a testimony to these three pillars working together. The initiative created a unique community of practice on climate security and provided an important impetus to the development of knowledge and intervention strategies directed at reducing climate-related security risks. If you want, please, huh? where am I? <laughs> please. Um, together with Sweden, the UK and others, we pushed for adequate climate risk assessment and management strategies. As a result, several UN missions in the Sahel and Horn of Africa have now been mandated to assess climate risks. Over the past few years, we have taken important steps towards reducing climate security risks but we are not there yet. I'm convinced that we can only address climate security risks if we work closely together, like we already do with the UK and others on the resilience and adaptation track as part of the Climate Action Summit that United Nations General Antonio Guterres is organizing in New York in September. In that spirit, I'm very proud that the Dutch Embassy is able to facilitate this event with such an imminent panel of Dutch and British experts that we consider our neighbors, of course. There is only a thin stretch of water between us, so we call, each other, uh, we call uh, each other the North Sea neighbors. And I'd like to invite you all to actively contribute to this session today. I am now very pleased to be able to give the floor to Nick Maybe, Chief Executive and the Founder Director of E3G, Third Generation Environmentalism, who will be moderating this event for further introduction. you're not going to be allowed to ask questions except through your mobile phones. So um, welcome, I am Nick Maybe. Um, thank you so much to the Dutch Embassy and the Ambassador for letting us use this wonderful venue. Um, thank you to uh, Klingendel and the Planetary Security Initiative for being partners in the event. 
and being partners on many, many years on this journey, and hopefully we will reflect on some of that experience. Um, what we're going to do today is to hear from some very experienced and eminent and informed experts, um, but hopefully in a way it's in a conversation that takes on the journey to know what to do next. So there's two sessions, one um, of a presentation by um, sorry, let's see, General um, Tim Mittendorf, I wanted to get your name right, um, who will, who's got your biography, was so actually intimidating when I read it, I'm, uh, I'm not going to go through all of it, but let's just say, if anybody knows how the Dutch military and NATO and international military cooperation works, then this person does. So, but then two respondents, Neil Morissetti um, and Amira Sawan, who will comment, and then we'll do a full panel session after that. Between those sessions, we're going to try out some technology and ask you to tell your opinion on a few questions and to put some questions up um, which couldn't work. So hopefully the technology will work. I will guide you through it, but you will need your smartphone at some point in the day, and it will need to have data, um, unless the, there's a Wi-Fi they can tune into. I'm assuming they won't be allowed to hack into the ambassador's Wi-Fi system. <laughs> so that's our, that's our schedule for this afternoon. Um, context. Um, I used to work in the UK Foreign Office and the government's um, Cabinet Office Strategy Unit. And in 2005, I co-commissioned the first paper on climate change and security for the Ministry of Defence. It's a very good paper it was too. And we wrote, <laughs> we wrote it into our security strategy. And in 2007, I wrote the paper for the UK's New York mission for the U first UN Security Council debate. It was two sides of paper. That was all we could find as evidence. A little bit thin, but there we are. It was a long time ago. First UN Security Council debate on climate security. 2007 was also the Solana paper written by the um, EU High Representative on Climate Security of the European Council. So we've been rolling around this area um, for a long time. And to be honest, though the risks have undeniably gone up and the impacts are indisputable on the ground, the response has actually been incredibly flat. In some areas it's gone backwards, like the US, started to tick up a bit more in the UN to be positive over the last few years. But really, we haven't stood up to the challenge. And to be honest, at the time, we used to get a lot of pushback from people saying, no, you shouldn't talk about security. You're securitizing. You're talking about bad things like migration. And right-wing populists will take that and, and, and they'll, they'll use that against us. Um, now we have people on the streets of London and in the homes in London and across the UK and other players and school strikers saying, civilization is going to end if we don't solve this problem. And everybody goes, yeah, that's obvious. You're thinking, that wasn't allowed to be said 10 years ago. The fact there was a fundamental threat to order security and not just marginal prosperity from an uncontrolled climate crisis. So I think the word on the street has moved forward. The conversation in countries, or several countries, have, has changed. People perhaps can talk about the worst case scenarios, which are the likely scenarios, unfortunately, um, a bit more clearly, which the security community has been doing, but perhaps not as loudly as it could have done. So we're going to try and get into two questions through the, through the afternoon. One is, how does climate security in the context, broadest context, play into this broader de societal debate about why we must act and action? Does it have a role? Has it been superseded by the climate emergency? What's its role in that debate? And secondly, how do we respond to the real urgent needs of managing the security impacts of climate change and resource scarcity using all the tools inside governments and non-governmental organizations from diplomacy to development to peace building and peacekeeping? So, that's the frame I want people to keep in mind, because we do want to get to some hopefully UK, Dutch, and other people cooperation by the end of the day. Um, but we'll start with, I say, the first session of presentation by General Mittendorf. Thank you. for the last five and a half years in the Netherlands. And in, the, in that period, I've been involved in uh, many meetings with my colleagues all over the world, in NATO, UN, EU coalitions. And climate change has not been mentioned once. Now, what does that tell us? And I think that needs to be changed. 
And that's why I'm here. So my bottom line is, we need to get the security sector more involved, and we need to see climate change also as a matter of national security. What I'm going to talk about is a few lessons that I've learned in the, in the 40 years that I've been involved in all kinds of crises. Uh, and then I will introduce to you a new network that we are building, a network of security experts on climate change and the nexus with security. Uh, and I will give you a, few, a short overview of that nexus. Uh, now, I know this audience is very knowledgeable about it, so I will do that very briefly. Uh, let's start the next slide with some of my lessons learned. I've been involved, this is a map of fragile countries all over the world. And the worlds of um, uh, aid workers, the worlds of development workers, the worlds of military workers, environmental specialists were very separated in the past. And we came from different angles. Uh, aid workers and environmental experts were more kind of the left wing tree huggers and the military were the right-wing hardliners. Uh, we were just looking for nails to hammer them down. Uh, but these worlds have grown together over the last few decades. And especially in the, in the many conflict areas, the many fragile countries that we meet each other, we have learned to appreciate each other. We have learned to respect each other, and we have learned that there is no security without development. But there is also no development without security. It has to go hand in hand. And that's where the, the whole comprehensive approach have been developed and being practiced during the last years, which is a very good development. Now the two lessons I take from all the dozens of conflict uh, areas that I've been involved in, uh, I would like to give you two lessons. One is this lesson that there is no security without development and the other way around. We need to have a, global, a comprehensive approach also on climate change. Also on climate change, uh, we need to work more comprehensively and the security sector needs to pick up its role. The second lesson I've learned is that what we tend to do is we look at uh, problem areas, problem regions, we put all our intel assets on it and we see the symptoms. And based on those symptoms, we build a picture. And based on that picture, we make decisions on how to deal with it. But that means that we are fighting symptoms. And what we have learned during the last decades is that it is very important to understand the underlying factors beneath those symptoms, to look at the root causes of conflicts. And one of these root causes uh, is climate change. And I will go into that more deeply. Climate change as a kind of a catalyst of conflicts, as something that fuels uh, the many causes of conflicts that are already present in these fragile areas. And as a chief of defense, one of my last acts was to raise this subject. I raised it in the Halifax conference, I raised it in the Planetary Security Conference in The Hague in 2017. And it triggered screaming headlines in the Netherlands. It triggered a heated parliamentary debate, but the heat was over within a week because people realized that it made sense, that there is this nexus and that we need to take it seriously. What was also very, uh, what struck me very much was that in the military, uh, when I raised this subject, there was no discussion. Everybody understood the need to look underneath the symptoms, to look at root causes, and everybody understood that climate change uh, does fuel these conflicts and needs to be taken into account. So there was no discussion within the military. And based on these lessons, I see climate change as one of the most important drivers of change to the future. And one of the most important elements that will shape our security environments. And that's why I say that climate change is also a matter of national security, not just a matter of national security. So I'm not securitizing the problem. The second thing I would like to do is, based on this insights, is introduce you to a new family. Because I retired, I'm not a military, as you can see, anymore. Uh, but I decided to dedicate it, uh, the next phase of my life, uh, to uh, this challenge. 
to use my experience to see how we can help address the, the big challenges that we are facing for the future and help avoid my children to uh, to be to have to bear to bear uh, sorry to carry this burden. And we triggered uh, a new network. Next, next slide, please. And this network is called the International Military Council on Climate and Security. It was initiated in the Planetary Security Conference early this year as one of the deliverables. And it's only a half year old. We are just starting to build it up. But already, uh, we have 40 members of more than 20 nations. And at this moment, all uh, countries in the EU are, are being invited to join. But we are also reaching out to Africa, Asia, and to other regions to make it more global. And the whole purpose of this network is to, to further build an understanding of the security dimension of climate change on a global level, on a regional level, and on a national level, because it's very different in what region you are, and it's very different per nation. And in this network, you can exchange insights, you can build knowledge, you can, can exchange best practices, and you can help each other on dealing with it. So this network, the whole purpose is to analyze, anticipate, and help address the security implications of climate change. Next slide. This network is a non-political network. So we are professionals looking at the problem. It's a network of networks, as you can see here. One part of the network are experts, like me, former military or former other experts from the security arena, military and non-military. Knowledgeable that can bring their expertise to help uh, do this analysis. Another part of the network are members from governments. I'm not talking about participants from governments or representatives, because we want keep it non-political. And the third part of the network are research institutions, because you have to build the knowledge base, you have to further develop uh, the knowledge on this nexus. And let me explain briefly how this, what this nexus looks like. And I would like to stress upon before, on beforehand that I'm not a climate expert. And I'm also not trying to securitize the problem of climate change. I'm just saying that it has a security dimension <coughs> and that also the security institutions need to take this dimension serious and need to pick up their role. I'm also a realist, a military realist, and I think we should face problems and look them in the eyes and deal with them. So let's go to the next slide and I will give you a short overview on how climate change relates to security. And let me start with a few drivers of climate change. Because they are connected. You see them here, the three. We've got the population growth, we've got resource stress all over the world, we are running out of resources, and we've got the impact of climate change. And these three elements reinforce each other. Our global population is expected to increase with two billion people. Increasing from seven to to 9 billion people all over the world, which means an increase in demand, demand for resources. Meanwhile, the resources are running out, and climate change is speeding up. A 3.5 degrees raise in temperature is expected uh, this century, and in countries like ours, we say, well, what is 2 degrees, 3 degrees, what is it? It only makes our summers a bit warmer. But the impact is enormous. Uh, so let's look at the impact. Next slide, please. And here you see an overview I found on the UK website, all the different kinds of impact that are out there. And we see the, the sea level rising. We see more food and water shortages. Uh, and with that, we have to realize that only 2%, 2.5% of all the water in the world is fresh water. 2.5%. And the 2.5% it's only 0.3% in lakes and rivers, 30% uh, in groundwater, and 69 in glaciers and in the polar caps. Now, our demand on water is increasing, an expected increase of 25% during the coming decades. Our demand of food is increasing with 50%. And meanwhile, we are depleting groundwater and other resources. 
So water shortage and food shortage will be a big issue. The next effect of climate change is that cities will increase to expand, not only because of the population growth, but also uh, because the farmers moving to the big cities. Uh, so a big migration is expected towards the cities, but also fleeing the areas that are affected by climate change most. Another effect is soil degradation and desertification. And of course, we all witnessed the severe weather events all over the world with breaking records every year. And last but not least, the sea level rise. I come from the Netherlands. Uh, one third of our population lives below the sea level. Uh, we got a very high sophisticated uh, delta works, but uh, it's built on a sea level rise of 70 centimeters. The expected sea level rise is two to three meters this century. So yeah, there's some work to be done. So yeah, you can imagine that in the Netherlands we are a bit concerned about that. How does that translate into area when we look at it geographically? And the slides here on the right depict that. And it, you see four kinds of rich areas. One are the drylands, the, the countries that are suffering because of water stress. And in these drylands, population is expected to increase from 2.8 to 4 billion people. So you can expect the impact of fuel, water, and food shortages on those populations, which will drive migration. The next risk area are the cities I mentioned. 70% of all the world population lives in cities. And two-thirds of those cities are along rivers and in coastal areas, affected by climate change. The third area are the transboundary rivers. We already see rivers that can hardly reach the coastline because they're drying out along the way. Currently, there are plans for 3,700 new dams in rivers. So countries are trying to hold the water in their country. What does that mean for the countries downstream? And what does it mean for the tensions between those countries? You can imagine what will happen there. And of course, last but not least, the coastal zones and the deltas. 1.6 billion people live in areas that are threatened by floodings. So there are different kinds of ways of looking at the effects of climate change on the different areas. Next slide. How does that translate into security effects? And I briefly depicted them on this slide. The first effect is that it will increase local tensions, and already mentioned was climate change as a catalyst for conflicts. It will result in more resource disputes. There are such shortages not only on oil, but also on water and other resources. A third impact will be geopolitical changes, the melting of the Arctic area, the energy transition and the effects on OPEC countries and the economies that now depend on oil. You can imagine that that will translate into different kinds of geopolitical power plays that needs to be taken seriously from a security perspective. The fourth effect is, of course, migration. And the UN expects 200 million refugees in 2050 just because of this. I'm not, not talking about conflicts, but just because of climate change. Then there are, of course, humanitarian disasters that we are confronted with in, with an increasing pace. Uh, the, the threat of floodings, which also threatens critical infrastructure along our coastlines. Nuclear power plants, naval bases, and other kinds of infrastructure. So there are many effects of security. And what does that mean for the security sector itself? And I'm from the military, so what role could the military play in addressing that? And the first role that I would like to mention is the, uh, the early warning role. We got intel uh, services in, in all countries. And I think the, the intel services should take climate change more into account in their intel assessments. In many countries, that's already happening. But in many countries, it's also not happening. Uh, and as we recognize climate change more and more as a driver of uh, also insecurity, uh, I think the intel services can be of help in early warning and uh, defining uh, indicators and warnings. The second role will be to protect key facilities along coastlines. We need to make our facilities, the key facilities in our countries, climate proof. The third role would be strategic adaptation. I mentioned the geopolitical impact of climate change, so we need to adapt. We need to rebalance 
uh, the way we provide security. A fourth role will be border protection. Increased migration flows into hundreds of millions, I think, until now, and migration was a big issue in Europe a few years ago, we ain't seen nothing yet. And the worst is yet to come. So we need to think about that, how to deal with it. And what does that mean security-wise? And how to deal with that security-wise? Uh, fourth one uh, is uh, disaster relief, of course. Uh, the impact of climate change will only become more and more. And uh, an important element of it is that the civil uh, organizations having to deal with it, with disaster relief, uh, will not be able to deal with it because they are also struck by uh, these same disasters. So they will need help from the military. So the call upon the military will become larger to provide uh, disaster relief. And last but not least, I would like to mention a, uh, another role the military could play, and that's being a platform for innovation. Many of the solutions that we are looking for can be technical solutions. How to extract water from the air, or how to do the energy transition, and I think the military can be a platform uh, for that innovation. So there are many roles the military could play. And having briefly gone over that because I had strict orders to, uh, to stay uh, very, to keep it very brief, uh, I will just conclude uh, by saying that uh, we as the military haven't taken climate change seriously enough and we need to pick up that role. Uh, we need to be aware that it is a global problem with very different aspects per region. So we need to find ways to connect national agendas with this global issue. And I hope the International Military Council that we are raising at this moment uh, can be uh, an important element of that solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we've got two respondents very really interested to, you to pick up on um, that role of, of the military and the broader security in, the, in this debate of a Labour Party or part of the debate or has Extinction Rebellion done it for us? But also, what should that response be? What should be some of those responses? Just a quick play with some, um, starting with Neil Morissetti, who shouldn't need that much introduction, um, former uh, Rear Admiral of the British Navy, um, Climate uh, Defence and Energy Security Envoy, followed by being the Climate Envoy of the UK, um, with a gap in between. <laughs> so I can't remember what you were doing. <laughs> um, he's been around a long time and has got amazing perspective on this. Nick, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Tom. There's not much I can really say after. I think you've covered everything. I'd just like to focus on one or two points, though. There's one thing missing from Tom's pictures of the world. That's the world trade routes. They run right through the middle of the area he highlighted, where we already see instability, volatility, fragile states, and nothing like as eloquently as Tom put it. You then throw this bucket of petrol called climate change on a smoldering fire. And because all our nations depend on trade, they depend on growth, economic growth, and prosperity, well-being, this is a threat to national security. And as such, the security community, in its widest sense, need to be engaged in this process. Not just the military, but also foreign affairs, international development, home affairs, uh, police forces, and the likes of our respective agencies, um, overseas and domestic intelligence. And the challenge is that brings together a bunch of actors who don't normally act together. They also need information they don't, no, don't normally have. Tom and I would be very good in the Cold War. In the land environment or the maritime environment, we could tell you what was going to happen, how it's going to affect us, and we knew a bloke in our respective countries who could ring up and ask, an academic, and they tell us the answer before we ever ask the question. The network doesn't exist today for understanding about long-range weather forecasts, prices of, of wheat, rice, harvest, what's happening, people moving. Only about 12% of people move from their own country. But that 12%, if you talk about 200 million, is a lot of people. And they'll go to countries where there's prosperity already. We need to understand how we analyze all that and build the system up. So that's the first thing I think the security community has got to do. And they can do it because actually the process is no different to many of the other threats we face, whether it's resurgent Russia, another state issue, ISIS or whatever, it's the same process we're using, but we're using to bring in different actors together because this is a 21st century challenge 
and it needs a 21st century solution. It then needs to be acted upon to reduce the risks. We need to develop a comprehensive climate risk management strategy for which the security community is part of it, but it's not the only part. Other elements of government, other elements of society need to work in that process. And we need to do contingent planning in the event that some of these risks come to fruition so we can deal with them, whether in our own country, whether in countries where there's strong diasporas in our own country, whether the countries affect our interests, or where just there's a global responsibility to act to help people who are, are facing it. So, is anyone here from the UK Ministry of Defence? What are we doing? starting to try to write the MOD's response to the government's commitment to net zero. Uh, and that's not to say that the UK MOD haven't been doing anything. We've been doing an awful lot for quite a long time, but I'd suggest that we've been doing more in the sort of sustainability direction and far less than perhaps we need to in the security direction. Yeah, and I think you're actually spot on. But that's where the shift of focus has to be. We have to sort of put the headlights on the full beam and look over the horizon and see what's coming. This is a strategic issue we need to address and we live in a tactical world. In other words, we're short-termist. And we have got to look longer-term and act and have to stay in power to do just that. That requires an exchange of knowledge and information between society and across government. And that, to me, is where our number one priority is. To work at that, so that our national security strategies, our respective countries and other countries, not only reflect the first order analysis that's done on many of these issues, but a deeper in-depth understanding and an understanding of where our priorities for action come from and how we can work together as partners to address those issues. Great, so that's not, a, uh, not an immodest approach to joining up government in a time of geopolitical fracturing. And I think that's one that shows, but I think you know, this is back to what we need to do, what's necessary, not just what look possible. And perhaps we might come back to how do we create the political conditions where such an ambitious approach can, can work, perhaps something for the, the next panel. Um, but I want to get a, perhaps a view, I want to say perhaps a top-down view, perhaps a view from the, um, the, the bottom up or closer to where issues happen. I'm um, really pleased to have Dr. Amir Saraz here who's done enormous amounts of work, particularly in Pakistan, actually looking at how these in interactions between security issues, um, gender, climate, etc. And just interested, what does this feel like from where you are? And particularly, we often because we're t talking about countries outside, but obviously security begins at home, and insecurity begins at home. And what does it feel like from the people you're talking and working with in different countries? Um, it's, it's quite interesting, actually, today, uh, because my husband's currently out in Pakistan. That's where he's from, and we spoke. I couldn't get hold of him yesterday, and I thought it was quite strange. And he contacted me this morning to say he was in hospital with heat stroke because you know, it had reached 52 degrees in the town where he is, where he'd grown up. And there's only so much that your body as an individual can actually cope with, even the healthiest of bodies. So you know, security, as it's lived and experienced, is not always um, you know, about communal violence or about state violence. You know, people, thousands of people are dying uh, under heat stress. And we should also think about security from that perspective. But I have sort of two hat hats on here. So was an academic before looking at these links, and now I'm working for ActionAid, which is a development organization. So I, I kind of have two different like, levels of experience, I would say, in, in thinking about these challenges. I think one of the challenges, it's, it's also you know, quite, it's quite exciting and interesting on the one hand to be talking about, you know, to be sitting in a room with military actors, and I've been doing that for a few years now, but that's very much this context here, whereas when I'm in Pakistan or in Jordan or wherever I'm doing a lot of work, if I get contacted or asked to be in a room with military actors, I'm normally really scared, as a you know, human rights researcher, about the implications. Why am I on their radar? What have I done wrong? You know, it's a very different context. The military can be very useful in the case of disasters. So in the case of the Pakistan mega floods, the military was actually the frontline service provider. But militarization in the context of Pakistan and other countries is actually very dangerous. So there's always a reticence from development actors and from civil society to securitize. We talked about that before, like fear of securitization. What does it mean? Um, who's going to take up the space? 
how will we be able to express the realities of security, which is very much blended into other security risks around state violence, for example. How does somebody who's experiencing extreme heat, but they're also experiencing police violence, state violence, economic violence, how can they express themselves if they're in the same room as, as the military and security services? So I would say that these are the main concerns that come up. However, you know, being involved in the planetary security initiative over the last few years, things, at least in you know, here, have shifted. So when I was first involved, or when I was first aware of it doing my postdoc, I certainly had that reaction as someone a bit more developmental, that, oh, this feels quite security, you know, it's very much a kind of hard security lens. But over the years, it has really shifted. So there are a lot more conversations between development actors, civil society, human rights, security, government. But I'm not sure that we're actually there yet in terms of countries in the global south. And I think we have to be very careful about how we bring in um, you know, security actors and how they interact with different stakeholders. Right, I think that's a, a good um, kind, of, uh, kind of warning or just a reality check that um, when you start talking about security, you do invoke very different forces. And sometimes they're very powerful and signs are dangerous, and that's the same as when you say things are emergencies. Because actually, in most countries, emergency sounds a great word, but for those of us who think about emergency powers, and though that means turning off certain democratic checks and balances in a country, you might think the word, the word emergency also carries with it loads of um, doing things without necessarily asking everybody if they permission, because things are so important. But climate emergency is the sort of word of the times at the moment, and. Um, and if Rob, we can get the questions up on, if everybody can pull out their smartphone, we thought we'd ask you s some questions about, about that before we move to the next panel. Um, so firstly, we wanted to kind of get a flavor of who's in the room, because as you've seen from the panel, um, who you are alters what you think about this. So the way this works is you go to the www.menti.com website, and it will ask you for a code, and you type in 502887, and you should have the options to tell us who you are on this first thing. It should start coming up. It's magic. <laughs> I'm an engineer. It's not really magic. <laughs> but it's also we work out how many people can do it because we'll see the numbers. <laughs> and I can count the people in the room. It defense, took defense quite a long time to work out how to use the app. <laughs> it's turning into a, a nice balance between people whose job it is to protect the national interests and people whose job it is to promote development interests. I like that. Okay, it seems to be uh, the others are trying to make a comeback, but I think the uh, <laughs> so as we're counting two defence out of it, so the defence gets slightly more. Um, okay, so I think that just shows we've got an interesting balance in the room, which when we ask you the next question, we'll play. So the next question, Rob, if you can put it up is should governments declare a climate emergency, yes, no, or it's complicated? <laughs> the diplomats, I know which one you're going to play. OK, so we have a... We have a I think all the diplomats voted it's complicated, plus one of the others. Um, but we have quite a large majority in the room for yes, with all the implications that being in an emergency, really taking that statement seriously means for how you engage things. So I think I have a lot of parallels with the security side. So we'll just kind of hold that in our minds. That's going to be the, um, the subject of the, the next panel to explore this a bit more. So can the other panelists come up?
virtually the beginning, I seem to remember talking to you. Um, Malcolm Grinnell from Lipid, who has been on working on resilience, adaptation, and all things um, climate change and natural disaster for longer than I've been in this game, certainly. Um, sorry, and you've met Tom Toya, who's running out of this. Um, and Karen Amon, who um, from the Dutch Foreign Ministry. So we're going to try and run this reasonably fluidly and then go to Q&A. So we're going to start with you as a panel. I'm going to start with the new panelists because they haven't had a chance to speak. So reflecting on what the others have said, reflecting on the fact that everybody in the room, or a large majority, think there should be a climate emergency, what should be the role of climate security and security actors in engaging with that, that climate emergency? And what does an emergency response look like to the security challenge? Yes, because of the live stream. Yeah, also welcome to the visitors from abroad who are watching this online. Um, yes, I think um, what we have learned over the past years when we were implementing the Planetary Security Initiative is that we really saw or realized that there is uh, uh, there that there is, has been an awareness since the early 2000s, also thanks to your e efforts and uh, in the UN Security Council and in uh, the EU context, but that there was still a lack of and then how to do it. You know, how can we reduce security risks uh, coming from climate change? What can we do um, to avoid water shortages? Um, in situations becoming, let's say, a root cause of the security issue or land issues. And what we have done over the past years is that we have looked also at specific cases, spotlight regions, we call them in the PSI language. So Mali, Iraq, Lake Chad, the Caribbean region after the hurricane season. So how can you act in such uh, circumstances? And most recently, I've been working on a paper for the Global Commission on Adaptation, also with uh, Camilla Bourne, uh, E3G colleague, and Elizabeth Selwood from UN Environment. And there we also make the case that more and more we should see whether we can use climate change also as an, as an opportunity to bring uh, parties in society who are in conflict or potentially in conflict uh, together, and that it demands perhaps not another set of development projects, well, possibly also, but it also requires indeed security actors to be much more aware of this and also much more efforts in terms of diplomacy, uh, mediators, facilitators that don't, do not only look at who are the groups uh, that are at odds in each other, with each other, for instance in the Sahel region, uh, the, the herm herders versus the farmers, but also what are they actually at odds about, what, what is the relationship with the land they live on, how is this affected by climate change, and that, let's say, typical diplomats who can help in mediation and preventing of conflict, and also um, security actors who are active on the ground have a greater understanding of this and also can use this uh, um, uh, to reduce the, the security risks on the ground. Mechanism, previously known as the mini mechanism. I don't know because people, it's quite new to people on work. It'd be interesting if you should just quickly explain what that is. But also, some of the, because through a network of academics, we've been inputting into real Security Council debates about real mission, um, real missions and designs of missions. Just some of the, the, the experience we've started to gain about how to do that, because that's trying to do what we've been saying for a long time and actually embed this in responses on peacekeeping missions and other what plan that is. Yeah. So what has been done is to create in New York a mechanism essentially of a few people, yeah, three people, but they are from different parts of the UN family, from BPA, the political part, from the UNDP, the development part, and from UN environment, where there is the knowledge on these environmental factors. And to have them, let's say, work across the UN system and ultimately also feed the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council with more of this information on uh, climate security risks and to establish toolboxes and to see ways where instruments can work together so that in the future, for instance, if the situation becomes unstable in Mali, and this is of course very topical, um, that you will not have, let's say, all the development projects being put on hold related to water, food, land, uh, whereas they're probably more needed than ever before if the situation becomes more unstable. 
yeah, so that there is a, a greater understanding. And this was necessary that is being done from the inside within the UN system, because in the UN Security Council, everything is so sensitive that you can't just have, you know, a British think tank report or a Dutch think tank report, and then that's the truth for the rest of the world. And this is not how it works in the UN Security Council context. And probably, <laughs> well, anyways, there is an argument for that. Um, so I think that will help to foster the understanding and also to work across, let's say, the UN system but it's only a small star step, it's only a start. I mean, this is, uh, uh, that's also, I guess, why it's called mini-mechanism originally. Uh, well, I think most of the people working in the UN all know the idea of getting a cross-departmental body that reports <coughs> to both the General Assembly and the Security Council and the Secretary General on an issue of hard security missions and peace building. That, that's quite an amazing feat. Uh, we played a part in it. The Swedish government were the ones who really put their diplomatic clout behind it and formed the coalition for their security council presidency. But if people didn't want it, it wouldn't have happened. So I think it shows there is an appetite. One of the most interesting ones, was case studies, was the Iraq, we knew it would be an Iraq peace building mission. Um, and sometimes these things are very simple. The main um, focus of that mission was to make sure that ISIS, former ISIS members had jobs to go to in the agricultural sector. It's a shame there's no water. Why? Because there's a drought. There's also some dams upstream. Um, one of those dams was meant to be part of our Ukraine export credits. I blocked that with my food in the Foreign Office when I worked there on the Elisu Dam because of the worries of dams being lost security back in the early 2000s. So it was quite interesting watching my previous life coming around. But these things are predictable. If people can build control, that creates a control of the potential, especially when there's no diplomatic systems around it. To mediate it. Um, I want to go to Malcolm now because I think there's this issue of how do you, a lot of work is done to do technical solutions on the ground, to do community resilience. This issue of adding in the more diplomatic mediation pieces, that's used use in the peace building area, that's not so much around climate. Again, this is practical. How do you build a rather good example of trying to build that, not just conflict sensitive, but actually using after, after disasters, in disasters, around crisis to build peace um, and to make sure that, is, that analysis of um, climate um, impacts informs peace building or peace building informs climate adaptation and resilience. So we're doing that already, and there's some good examples of where that's working, um, or is this still new frontiers for us to go to? Um, well, I suppose I've been in the business long enough, and I used to be NGOs, that my immediate reaction of working with the military is one of nervousness. Uh, when I was in the field, you kept as far away from the military as you possibly could uh, because A, they were dangerous, and B, they didn't talk your language, uh, and C, they'd probably muck up your program. Um, I think that has profoundly changed as the world has changed. And uh, the, in terms of thinking about what happens after disaster and maintaining uh, some kind of reasonable order, I think that... Uh, the traditional military way of doing things, of imposing order from the top, isn't going to work. Uh, the traditional way of persuading everybody to get along um, from a development point of view isn't going to work. And the way in which uh, development work, diplomacy, and security can work together so that people who are affected by the disaster understand what their options are and can rely upon them. Uh, is going is extremely important. I think that kind of negotiation of how uh, individuals who are affected know what they can expect, know where, where they can go, know where they can get redress. And so some of the accountability mechanisms in, in disaster relief, some of the ways in which people are much more involved in delivering the relief themselves rather than getting some inscrutable system to deliver it to them, are all, all ways forward to actually rebuild some of the stake that people might feel they have in that situation. And there's no shortcuts. So for example, uh, in one of our programs, there has been a way of negotiating new calls uh, for moving of cattle in the Sahel. Traditionally, the cowman and the farmer are not friends. And the, in fact, making sure that as people move south in terms of their, uh, their moving of cattle. Getting those communities to talk to each other and getting agreed routes there 
and getting at agreed ways of re dispute resolution, which may or may not involve the law, are so critical, and there are no shortcuts. And I think that you, the new found uh, partnership between security, government, military, development, uh, community work, uh, is a way to go to deliver that whole package. And I think that I can see some respect now coming from to the military from the development side, and I would hope that some of that's coming back the other side, uh, as the complexity of the situation to trying to deal with dawn on people, uh, and they realize that it's not something that you go in and provide, te provide a technical fix for in 10 minutes, and that we need to be patient. Yeah. So just follow up on that, because I don't think you get the good pilots, and we've got the pilot of the UN, how we do it, we do that elsewhere. We have examples, um, often driven by particular individuals or particular organizations have particular skills. Is this scalable? How would we get that kind of, I mean, how would we get the intent to invest in that type of resilience, social resilience essentially, in places we know, because like, we know which one's going to be vulnerable, we just don't know how it's going to turn out. Is that something, you know, how do we get, because often we get kind of pilot projects or good programs, but they don't turn into, in a sense what the security analyst wants to know is, has there been an actual change in the resilience of this country relative to the pressures on it, not have there been five good projects? And that kind of bridging that micro projects to the, the macro impact, where are we at in the, in the field on, on that challenge? I share your skepticism about pilot product projects. I guess if I see another thing headed pilot project, I'll probably scream. Um, I agree with you, that's not the answer. But neither is it the answer to think, oh, well, we've got a blueprint now, let's go and apply it. Because that's not going to work either. And I think that I go back to the fact that there are no shortcuts. There are things that you know that you need to do in terms of understanding livelihoods, understanding some of the dynamics, listening to people, putting together a, a system that works well. And indeed, actually, sometimes that's not so hard. Um, I remember years ago, UNHCR wanted to register people in a displaced person's camp and they wanted to herd people into a barbed wire compound and, and count them as they came out. A classic security issue. Um, people are very good. It doesn't matter whether you count it or get out. What matters is if you have a card and there was corruption, so there are lots of cards. We were, went to the women's groups, gave them exercise books and notebooks and said, why don't you count the people in your block and come back with the numbers? And our numbers were much more accurate, much cheaper, and didn't make people resent authority. So, I mean, it's just a question of the way you approach things, which is so much more important, and the way the worlds talk to each other, which is, I think, the way that we can, we can move forward on this. We advise that the Netherlands, everyone's sustainable development. Sustainable development is all about making these connections between these different types of actors and skills and sectors. Um, I'm interested in your approach, but particularly, how are you trying to the Netherlands, and I know you are trying, to join up these different elements? Because if you need all of these elements to understand each other, support each other, not always going to be leading, how do you try and make that work in a, in a practical, bureaucratic sense? In the end, these still animal organizations and systems and everything else, it's fine having ideas, but they have to turn to institutions to really work. So how do you move that forward and make these different cultures perhaps work together um, better and more normally. I suppose this should be what the new normal looks like. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, we are like Ministry of Foreign Affairs and um, it has two pillars, the development uh, cooperation and the diplomacy side. We're in the same house, so this is already an asset. Um, and to yeah, to reply to your what you said before that you never heard defense speaking about climate uh, change, Last week, I was in a meeting with colleagues from the uh, from defense, but also diplomats, and I asked them, so what do you think are the biggest risks that we're facing? And immediately, the reply was water scarcity and climate change. So your message has uh, landed. Um, so um, with regard to cooperation, yes, we, um, we have now incorporated much more um, our development program in our foreign uh, foreign policy. We are we have uh, country strategies that combine the two and they reinforce each other. For instance, um, last week our minister one was in Mali, uh, Minister Kach for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation, and there our 
efforts are directed at pre prevention, but also addressing the root causes of conflict. Um, and she signed uh, an MOU on um, to ensure that inclusive and sustainable um, La sorry, to ins ensure that inclusive, um, that land is more inclusive and sustainably used between the different groups that are living there. It's, um, it was in the Suru region, a region which is, say, almost 80, covering 80% of the Netherlands, quite large. And as you mentioned, the, the agricultural, yeah, the farmers and the pastoralists, they're both there. And in they used, well, it used to be that. Um, the farmers would harvest their crops and then the pastoralists come in uh, and their f cattle would uh, feed on the last bits of, the of, of food that is there. But now, due to the, the cattle is hungry, due to the pressures reducing water, we see that there is so much, the m much more ingredients for, for conflict. Um, so now we, we try with our diplomacy and development efforts in that region to... Uh, to work towards more, s yeah, a stable, peaceful uh, environment. I think there's two more good stories. So I'm enjoying the kind of solutions based, and we're going to get back to our usual sort of writing about nothing working. But there's one <laughs> other the other panel sort of some of both. Again, give us give the audience an example of somewhere you think this is this is working. Because again, I think when I do low carbon transition, there's always tons of places it's working, even if it's mostly in Holland actually. Um, <laughs> if you about efficiency or heating, um, and then we try to scale them up, but Often we talk about the risks here, but what about the examples of where we've made a tangible difference to the resilience of major communities to significant problems that are climate and soil sensitive? That we feel, in a sense, a bit of a beacon of hope. People should think this isn't just, and I, my worry is people just start to go, it's too difficult, it's too Yemen to use a phrase. I mean, it's just, there's nothing one can do, it's just palliative care, humanitarian, but we don't really expect resumption of a normal society here um, and we don't want to get to that point because because passion fatigue as we've seen in the Mediterranean is a very real thing even with Europeans one person dead in the Mediterranean used to be a front page issue now thousands is you know not even reported so um, what are some of the beacons of hope we can look at where should we be putting investment backing ideas and examples then we've got some more some more good things to share Come on, somebody <laughs> must have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Neil went first. It was, it was a mess. Microphone. It's not a regional one. I think. It's about technology. Um, a lot of the things that can help build resilience in countries which are vulnerable and fragile are based around having the ability to grow their economies and therefore they need energy, they need resources, they need water, etc. And I think the security community, and in particular the military, have learned quite a lot in the last few years, and it picks up on Tom's point about in a sense using it as a test bed from expeditions and expeditionary operations, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, that has now been used in the in the commercial world to allow people to build some of that capacity and resilience. I can't say there's one particular community and say, watch, they've got it, that's wonderful, but there's undoubtedly it, many examples of where it is where it is coming into communities and they are therefore becoming more that resilient because they're building the basis from which to grow their economy. Yeah, I would like to further uh, go into this technology part. Uh, I mentioned uh, the role of defense as a platform for innovation. Uh, let me give you two examples. As a result of a, a future force conference we had, we uh, introduced this idea of defense as a test bed and we invited uh, young innovators and uh, uh, new companies to introduce their technologies and we would facilitate that. So one of these innovators had the idea to extract water from the air in the desert and we facilitated his idea and uh, took him into Mali in the desert and created a kind of a testing environment for him and he ach uh, achieved in doing that. So he, But he produced one glass of water per day and it evaporated <laughs> from the spot. So it wasn't very impressive. But um, Based on the idea, he further developed it. And he is now at the point that he is delivering a piece of equipment, very cheap technology, and a solar panel that can deliver 25 liters of water in the desert per day out of the air. Now, imagine the impact of innovations like that. If you do that more large scale, if you introduce that in the local villages, 
and the difference that those kind of innovations can, can mean uh, in those areas. And this is just one example. Uh, another example is on energy transition. I'm now involved in a, a test bed where we uh, try to use military facilities as a regional energy hub. So uh, use the facilities to combine wind, solar energies, but also geothermal energies and uh, biomass. Uh, and create kind of a hybrid energy system that no, not only supports the military facilities, but also its environment. And by doing that in your home country, you can support the local communities, but by doing that in mission areas, you can also reduce your own ecological footprint. Because at this moment, the UN, for instance, when they go into a country, the first thing they do is build mega bases. And they drill a lot of holes in the ground to, to extract groundwater to take showers and to have drinking water. Mm -hmm. uh, but the effect is that the villages around that mega base have a trouble of extracting enough water because their wells run dry. Uh, so we have a very negative impact at this moment just by being present. Uh, and you want to reduce that. So I think technology can also help in that extent. So we should think uh, also in opportunities. And we discussed that before. Uh, it's not only about thinking in problems, it's also about thinking in opportunities that can help the military reduce logistical burden, reduce the ecological uh, impact that they have, and uh, be part of the solution. Also the use of geodata. We see that for early warning systems, using geodata with local data, socioeconomic data, data on conflict, move migration, to combine all this data, we can better predict where we have a yeah, a dangerous mix of, of ingredients where climate change can be the threat multiplier. We have a water peace and security partnership where we have water actors and development, uh, water um, uh, experts and development experts together where, and they sit with the local community around the table to discuss how to deal with these uh, risks. It's a very interesting and promising uh, program. I'm going to go back to saying there's not a lot new under the sun. And a lot of the technologies that are really useful are well known, well tried, well tested. Uh, terrace your land, digs wide pits, reforest the land. And sometimes that it fails because of uh, policy. And a very simple policy change can make a difference. So I think it's in Chad. Uh, where there was tree planting, it was on state land, there were state trees. A simple change in the local law, if you plant a tree, it's your tree. Massive increase in tree planting, massive increase in fruit trees, massive increase in reforestation. And I think that's why, in terms of the Detective General's comment, Summit coming, which we're doing with the Netherlands as well, in terms of adaptation and resilience, the importance of countries saying, actually, we need to take this climate thing seriously. We need to put it at the center of all our policy making and think what we may do different in order to drive change. And sometimes that's as simple as saying, if you plant a tree, it's yours. Yeah, I just wanted to um, s talk about some opportunities and positives, but also caveat. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, you know, at ActionAid, we also, we, we're using apps to sort of crowdsource information, which have been really, really useful. So we've got apps around, you know, gender-based violence, and we're currently in the process of developing an app which can, like, ground climate data, uh, where all sorts of people in society in areas where they haven't got localized climate data can be feeding in and, you know, analyzing it collectively and thinking about the implications. Um, but technocratic solutions don't work if you don't focus on structural issues. So <laughs> I can give you an example of where a technocratic solution has gone wrong. And I didn't write this policy paper. We have it, though, on the ActionAid website. A colleague of mine did. So he looked at the African risk capacity drought insurance in Malawi. And the technology was off. And so it missed out about 1.75 million people at risk of like severe drought. Uh, and as a result, they, they didn't pay out the insurance, so the drought then turned into a disaster. So this was very much kind of just focusing on the numbers and the technology and the model was wrong. But had they actually engaged locally with people about what was going on, then perhaps they would have had more of a kind of perspective on the risks. So I think these are all really great solutions if we're working in societies where you don't have structural marginalization, where you don't have 
you know, like the issue of tr the tree is a great idea if that person has tenure to that particular piece of land. Um, but what about when you're in states like, you know, Pakistan, I know it very well, so I'll refer to that. Like, you know, they, their land acquisition law is from 1894, and there are different definitions of how you measure a yard of land. So <laughs> there are millions of people living on pieces of land which can be taken at any moment by the government, and it's happening, um, being sold to private sector actors, sometimes for really good, you know, like mitigation things, like massive solar parks, which of course are very useful, but then if you're displacing a bunch of people, where do those grievances go? What happens to them? They fester over time. It's another reason why people are frustrated about marginalization. It's another reason why there isn't a good relationship with the state. And so where do they go when they have a bad relationship with the state? They go to whoever plugs the gap. And that's often not necessarily the most conducive actor for peace and security. So I think that you know we can come up with these great ideas, but and we should work on them. But that should be kind of the icing on the cake of working on the deeper structural issues around marginalization, land rights, you know, gender inequality, and all of those major factors. Yeah, two things. I think one of the things I wanted to mention is really that we have this website, planetarysecurityinitiative.org, and that's where we also try to feature these examples. So I, this is also a call to the audience. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us because we want to shift, let's say, contribute. because. A lot of the debate on climate security in the past has been on is there a relationship between climate and security <coughs> and how does that work exactly? It's an important question because if you want to remedy you need to have this insight but it has also sometimes taken us hostage with let's say prevented us from going to the next step evaluating approaches and maybe also bad practices but people are not so open of submitting them <laughs> uh, where you can, you can draw on lessons but in any case to sh showcase more of these examples where looking at uh, natural resources, food, water scarcity can be of help. And then another thing I wanted to mention is in light of this paper that we, we, we have written for the Global Commission on Adaptation, which should, should be published somewhere over the summer, um, is really that there is more, let's say, interest and funding in the security migration issue in the MENA region and also in more funding for climate adaptation. But we know from development cooperation how difficult it is to have also this politically informed approach to development cooperation. So not that you're going to give the money in a very te technocratic way to elites of a country and then you know it's going to be wasted. So let's say let's not let's say make the same mistake eh, with with extra funding potentially becoming available. So I think yes, uh, this agenda can be a catalyst to scale up activities. But please, let's 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 also let's avoid that the typical climate change people, which are typically climate adaptation people, which are typically engineers who think about water infrastructure works and you know the big uh, projects. Uh, please also try to use, let's say, a politically informed approach when spending this money and know, let's say, how it fits in the. Uh, political environment you invest this uh, project in and that it's really linked to also the diplomacy uh, 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 in this in this country I think that's also for us uh, something we really really wanted to add let's say I think we're going to sew this piece up here perhaps this is part of the um, the, the agenda for the for the council which you're constructing it seems to me there's still a gap between the kind of bottom-up practitioner and the top-down resource allocator. And if some of those resources aren't money or security, so they're politics. If you want to engage a country on land rights, you're going to have to decide if you're going to, if you're an external country, whether you're going to do trade deals, security cooperation, terrorism cooperation, or harangue them on land rights. So that becomes a diplomatic prioritization issue as well of your broader diplomatic engagement. And unless those top-down forces understand the value of doing other things. They won't allocate resources and reform the way they join people up and have physically informed development because that's will require a decision to make those things happen. And so that for me is where where the gap is. And we did a, a review, talked to a lot of policymakers who were trying to get the 30 billion allocated to stabilize North Africa after the Arab Spring. Um, and we did some work with them in 2013 and we went back three years later and said, has this money made any difference to resource and climate scarcity, vulnerability and security? And they went, no. And so we took them through a systematic thing of where the blockage was. And there were three main things. The first one was um, it looked like a risk on top of lots of other risks. We called it the, the pile of risks theory. If you add yet another risk on top of, you know, 
terrorism, gender, clientelism, you know, petro states. Um, so it's not Pakistan, really, I'm talking about. Um, it's just they say, well, it's just one other risk. We can't, you know, it doesn't make any difference. It's already failed and fragile. This isn't making it any more failed and fragile, really. Well, that's not true, actually. That's not, but that's about having really deep strategic understanding of how these forces fit together and how you can do them. But they didn't have that. So that was a, to stop decision makers actually thinking it was worth thinking. But it was also that they didn't know solutions worked. They didn't have any data on what had worked at scale to actually improve resilience and social stability. So they said, we don't know what's good. So that was a big gap in their view too. And the last piece was, even if we get there's a thing here which would make a difference, and we think we can see examples we could apply, um, our system can't do that. You know, we're not joined up in the right way. We don't have you know, politically informed development. We don't have that kind of capacity. So they needed to make the, the, the pipes they put their engagement with through differently. Um, now, it might be a different set of policymakers who come up with a different set of things, but those were three very strong things from US and European policymakers. Um, but it seems to me that kind of bridge between the top down resource intent politics and the bottom up real knowledge of actually these complex situations, how they work, is one of the, you know, it's what's stopping us perhaps scaling. And that's an area we should, we should take forward and look at in more, in more structured detail. You can't just kind of do this through one paper, this is a proper institutional reform process. Um, which needs kind of teams to work on it who have got multiple different approaches. Um, I'm going to ask Rob to tell everybody how to do the next piece because you're going to set the agenda for the next bit of the conversation. So, um, can you explain how to yeah. use the next? Well, it's the same as what we did before. I'm going to I'm going to get rid of the screen. That's good. And then uh, you can load up the Menti code once again and just input your questions. Uh, you'll be able to see other people's uh, questions as well. So if you think you've got a good question, put it in right now. Everyone else will be able to see that, and you should be able to upload it, essentially. So that hopefully the, the, the best questions will um, make their way to the top, the ones that are the most burning. So we're gonna spend five, five bit more minutes getting some questions up there, voting for the best ones so we start to settle down, gives the panel time to get some water, and. Calm down. So, so you're, it's, your, it's not your job. They're off for a few minutes and you're on in terms of showing what brilliant questions you have.
let's say that there is among the population another group in society which is really fearing, uh, let's say, the costs of climate action. And if you uh, don't uh, bring these people along, and if you don't take away, let's say, fears about costs to houses and cars, <laughs> and because that's what a lot of people in the population also care about, I think such a transition doesn't have enough you know, societal backing. Uh, so yes, I, I, I agree with, let's say, these, uh, these uh, voices in society, and I also uh, agree that we should pro probably take climate science more seriously, uh, but it's always, let's say, uh, the politicians in our democracies that balance these different uh, perspectives, let's say, the economic uh, perspectives of groups in society and the voices. But anyways, you see it's also very promising, let's say that, for instance, in Germany, the German gen generations now overwhelmingly vote for the Greens because of the climate issue. So you see also that there is a segmentation in society, and perhaps the older generations, in Europe they are more, <laughs> should also be a bit more complacent towards the younger generation and their demands. Because otherwise, let's say, the uh, solidarity between generations will become so are you um, are you going to be out there as uh, in your chief of staff role? You were there to speak to his tower about security threats and levels. It's pretty existential. Yeah. How do you speak to this today? Well, I think if you address the audience in, in the narrative, you should take three things into account. One is how can we make it tangible? Uh, climate change is a very big issue, and for most people, it's too big, too big to comprehend, and too big to see uh, what can I do? What does it mean for me? So we have to make it very tangible for the people in the society that it is also their problem and that they, they can be part of the solution. So that would be one part. Uh, the second part is that we uh, should provide ways and feel them uh, providing ways in, in which they can be part of that solution. And the third part would be to stimulate that. So I think government can do a lot of that on stimulating people to make this energy transition and switch to electrical cars. and. Uh, switch from oil and gas uh, uh, equipment to other kinds of equipment. Everybody can contribute to that. You have to make it very tangible and you have to make it attractive. And if you can include those things in your narrative, then people start moving. And, and as Louise said, the is already a movement. Uh, especially in, in the new generation. Uh, if you look at the schools... The generation says that movement is not going to tell you because science is separate to them beating up on the cars. Yeah, um, yeah and it was, it's fun, they're fun conversations, but the basic point is it's more dangerous than your, and, and we're taking on, and we need to move faster. Yeah. And one of the reasons is because they think it's a fundamental threat. Yeah. So they were framed as civilization, but what they mean is security. It's just interesting. Two other voices, when we get to the audience questions, any other voices want to come back on this? Maybe it's just, it, is it the security people now pulling back from security as a frame now that the, the street has picked it up? Well, I think you do need that sense of urgency. Uh, and this uh, sense of urgency that brings also the children to, to the squares in, in, in the cities to demonstrate. I mean, I don't know actually the official position on this, so this is my <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I welcome it. I welcome as many different kind of voices on the issue as possible because I think with my academic hat on, discourse is power and discourse is shift and that impacts how we do things. So I do, you know, I support it and the more kind of people we have kind of bringing this to our attention and in public discussion and narrative and hopefully it will get through to our quite challenging media which I do believe is part of the problem that we have uh, and maybe you know the urgency will start to be felt by the people who currently would rather drive their car and don't necessarily relate to or think about the people on the other side of the world who are you know struggling to you know access a glass of water every day or at the risk of Security risks. Just one to finish before we go to the next guy. I can't really give you an answer about Russia, but if you look at the States, it's very tempting to look at it from the perspective of inside the Beltway in Washington. Or what the current administration is doing, or at least the EPA and others, um, walking back on the reforms that were being made by the Obama administration, which in themselves actually were pretty timid anyway. There's a lot more that could be done. 
But then you've got to look outside that. You've got to look at the state level, the local level, what the governors are doing, what the mayors are doing, what populations are doing, in red states as much as blue states. And they're doing it. In some instances, it's because of a, a global concern about climate change. It's an important issue to many of the American public, it is to many of the European public. But they're also doing it because they can see benefit in doing it. They can see benefit in cleaner air, they can see benefit in stable prices for energy. Texas, uh, unsubsidized wind and solar is cheaper than oil and gas. People want that unsubsidized wind and solar power to reduce their, either their domestic bills or their, the, the energy input into their, into their businesses. And ultimately, they will put pressure on Washington. And it's going to come from the American public, from the governors that going to Washington and talking about it, from, from the city mayors, etc. Let, let me ask you a different one. So, Lawrence Tubiana tweeted out two days ago, he was after to Paris, one of the architects of Paris, with the conclusion of the EU Mercosur trade deal, that unless Brazil has got its act together on climate, we should use the very fluffy powers now on climate to not import their goods. That's, that, that, because they are there would be damaging our climate security, that was it, the assumption. Do you agree with that? That as a tactic that we should start flexing our economic muscle, make economic access to our markets conditional on people doing what they promised to do at Paris? Yes, provide our own housing. <laughs> and it's not yet. We've got to get our own housing. Well, yeah, I mean, even if glass houses don't throw stones, it's very tempting, you know, thinking you're going to spend a you want to look like this. And there's some really good things in Europe. But there's crap in other areas. And we've got to get better before we start casting the for others. Any other views on the great power question? I think there will always be countries that will not get along or will hesitate to get along. What we should not do is let ourselves be paralyzed by these attitudes. So we need to get on. And we need to pick up the issue anyway, whether they are on board or not. Uh, the second one, uh, I think, is that we have quite a good trust in that uh, they will come to a realization that they should also do something at some moment. Uh, if I look also at the, at the US, I see the intelligence services taking this very seriously. I see the Pentagon taking this very seriously. And I see the state level taking it very seriously because they feel it every day. So at some moment, this will translate into political support. Uh, maybe it will take one or two years, maybe the next president, but it, at some moment it will translate and also in So they need to do something about it. Uh, and we can build that understanding, help them build that understanding, and maybe sanctions or uh, kind of a conditional trade can help in doing it. So we before argued that the trade instrument of the EU is still a relevant instrument that you could use for your climate agenda more than it has done in the past. And it's perhaps, uh, let's say, in, in, in addition to persuasion, uh, let's say, um, really demonstrating that it pays off to be the front runner in the transition specific, for instance. Uh, and I also think the same realization you see in China that were, of course, already very much uh, aware of the need for the transition to the low carbon, uh, uh, to, the, to the low carbon, carbon economy, also because they had a lot of issues with local pollution of coal in the, in the cities. Uh, but they also, I think, increasingly start to realize that the uh, impacts of climate change are also something that might you know, affect uh, the Belt and Road, uh, the solar. Uh, the, po the polar silk road that they're now <laughs> proposing. Um, and eventually, I think also for Russia that's the case. You know? Also, it's not in Russia's interest if the Arctic melts away at a certain point in time because they have a much bigger external border to affect. It's a lot of the things that are interesting for Russia. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I agree with uh, Tom Hillenburg. I just that some governments think differently at this point in time. Australia is also a typical swing state. It uh, doesn't mean that it's a, we should um, have our own policies in place. What about, I mean, Pakistan is a very interesting country. Lots of Chinese funded coal power stations in the middle of terrorism belts, very, very vulnerable to climate change, huge amounts of tension, and neighbors who are vulnerable. How do we deal with Pakistan, but strategic neighbor on anti terrorism? 
Department on Terrorism, there's a lot of things going on in relationships with Pakistan. I don't think anybody has a diplomatic strategy towards it, to be honest. What would yours be? Because it's uh, in terms of the, the uh, European Union, not with climate. Yeah. Well, you don't know. Okay, so again, actually, I was working in Pakistan at the moment. <laughs> But my prior work when I was at Imperial, actually, I was looking at China Pakistan economic mm. corridor investments. Um, and what is effectively happening there is China is displacing its emissions into another country. Um, they're investing a lot in renewables, though. It's not that they're not, but they're also investing a lot in you know massive coal plants, and that's what people want. That that's what people at the top want, because. They believe, and this is what our research showed, that you know we haven't been the big emitter, and that's true. The, the, the issue of population is debatable because some of the most populous countries in the world have emitted the least. Some of the most rapidly growing populations have been emitted the least. So why should they, in their opinion, why should they not invest in coal so they can have you know, rapid economic development? And this is a debate that I always have, or was having quite a lot during that project with them around, but you're experiencing climate change so severely here that it's going to affect your economic development in other ways. So one of the challenges with the investment for the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is that the, it, it's dependent on how each government is willing to negotiate the rights of the citizens. So in the case of, I believe it was Malaysia, they said, wait, hang on. You know, if you're not going to like observe the labor laws, if you're not going to create job opportunities for the people here, then we're not interested in this investment. But in the case of Pakistan, it was a slightly different scenario. So there's, it's, it has created some jobs, but not secure jobs, not many, and there have been displacements of populations. And there have also been a, a lot of frustrations which have played into interprovincial security dynamics. So, if I were the EU, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of the EU, but what I can say is that, um, um, as you were saying, what we, I mean, all I can say is that there is a, a, a lack of knowledge from the outside on the realities. There is even a lack of knowledge in the tops of society and you know, the debates within Pakistan. If you speak to some middle class people living in, you know, Islamabad. They really have no idea of the realities of what's going on with the displacements and the security dynamics and the, you know, uh, I want to say non-state armed groups who are seeing this as an opportunity to kind of capture narrative. And so I just feel that we shouldn't be so, we should be very careful about kind of giving countries a pass that are investing um, and like displacing their emissions into other countries without thinking about kind of human rights, thinking about land rights, thinking about the potential security implications in the long term. <coughs> we'll move on from this one. There's a lot to dig into that, but I think that just shows again why I actually have deep understanding of the implications. You can make some very um, glib trade-offs about economic access or friendliness with other countries, not realizing what that's leaving behind. The second most popular, or certainly what I wanted to move to next, we haven't covered it, um, was on geoengineering. Obviously, and I'm including in geoengineering, there was a big problem, yeah. Do you think geoengineering needs to be added to the climate security agenda, and if so, how? And we differentiate between sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, which I include, which I, I mean, for this thing, for the engineering, is not planting nice bits of new forest, um, unless it's taking people's land waste, growing lots of energy crops and putting them in a power station, sucking it underground. So large scale technical geoengineering of carbon, or so the radiation management, let's take we find some of the for sulfur in the atmosphere and reflect the sunlight, like map in the two merger. So that type of geoengineering, so if you're in a crisis, do you take crisis action? And this is crisis action, and I know lots of people going around PowerPoint saying how cheap it would be, particularly on the second one, to cut half a degree or three quarters of a degree off warming, give us time to adapt by putting radiation management in the uh, especially now that different countries are doing their own experiments all over the world, uh, not talking with each other. It, it's, it's kind of a global screwdriver you're using in, uh, in different, uh, from different countries. So I think it's a very tricky part of it. Uh, but still, it can be part of a solution, uh, but we need to do this uh, very cautiously. Yeah, that's why for this issue, definitely, the need to think about what's 
in security terms, only will be with allies and to offset in the future. So it's a, there's definitely multiple dimensions of that. Again, in government, it's nobody's job to be in charge of the geopolitical impressions of geoengineering. Because the geoengineering will generally fall under the climate ministry or the bio ministry, who are several layers from anybody who's thinking about those pieces. So it's one of those areas where you need to to join up to get a whole of government approach because it doesn't really fit anywhere as anybody's number one priority. Um, the third question, which I was going to pick out from the audience before lots of votes, it's not the blue screen. Um, it's, it's a more general one again, back to the first, more the first discussion, which is how do we bridge this gap between the political, political will, which is not a black box, it's something you can change, uh -huh. well done, between technical expertise and political will to recognize and act on a climate emergency. And I'm, um, let's start with this where we were before. Inside the group of ministries and agencies and non-governmental groups who are trying to act on the climate emergency on the ground and the security impact, how do we do this? But then perhaps more generally. But I think there is a, the mitigation space is quite aged and more joined up. And I think that that is certainly going to be a, one of the conditions for success, especially for non development so one of the things we're looking for at that climate summit is this political pact, and I, uh, uh, an undertaking that we're going to do things differently, things differently, which is about putting factual climate risk into all the core decisions that are made, about making being serious about the wickedness of the problem that we're dealing with, and setting up those systems whereby. Uh, local actors can talk to national actors and vice versa to get the kind of nuanced and detailed action that is going to be necessary uh, so that these resources can be used well. And also then paying attention to uh, what, the what some of the real nub of some of the problems where people are feeling uh, some of the most effects. And that's gonna, uh, that can be around water, land, food, um, so land degradation, uh, a lot of uh, smallholder farmers talking about the patterns of development. You can't keep Jobs pouring people in those mega cities, but having that break sooner or uh, later. Real look at what, uh, what needs to happen and starting real look about what needs to happen and starting that conversation a lot of it is the about political action, the action which is a lot of the race local local political action, including those to the private sector, 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 so they understand the risk, including those to the private sector, so they understand the risk site is the way to go. Because we do have to get out of this adversarial approach to, to adaptation and start to starting to see that it, it's a shared problem. And I think that's beginning to happen. It, it's a and shared problem. problem. One of our and I think that's beginning to happen. That it actually and that's gives that one process of our a bit of a push. Push. Something that it actually gives that process a bit of a push. Yeah, climate adaptation has been something that the Netherlands has been. Yeah, climate pushing adaptation has been a year. Something that the Netherlands has been pushing global warming. Commission on adaptation last year has been big names. Commission on adaptation last year has been big names. There are advocates for more action. There are advocates for. Um, more action during the climate action adaptation. summit. Uh, the Commission um, also launched the climate action the summit. Uh, the Commission also launched. And it will mark a start of a year of climate action. And it will mark a start of a year of climate action. And we will have a summit in the Netherlands in action. October. And next we will have a summit in the Netherlands take stock in October of next year. Is where we what are we doing? What are we doing in our what are we doing? Are we doing an action summit? Has this has started? Has it actually resulted in more action on adaptation? Has it actually resulted in more action on adaptation? Any other comments? Any other thing? Comments? When you do a top down vote, things that you often end up with. When you do a top down vote, high you often end up with the end of the vote type of vote. It illuminates those structural changes. So. Again, this is, for me, it's not just, you know, the boss of these organisations have to say, yes, we're going to make more money to adaptation, because they have, and it's not going to happen at all. We know that, it has been out of the place of the RETA fund, rather than place of the HOT fund by fragile states. So what do we need to do? We need to have some more fundamental changes, like more people in these countries who have bothered for 10 years to build capacity, a change to how we build capability and capacity, which perhaps our accountants or our aid regulators or some of the other rules we have about good value for money and things like that get in the way of because some of the, the, there's quite a lot of money not being spent already even if that's not enough money. So something has to change in the structure we're doing even if we get more political will to push 
out of love, it's true, it's true. it was as and love, that's we love it. Can I on that, because you, you get one of my many hobby horses. Um, I um, was very struck I, when I once, uh, I was, was very struck when I once, uh, I was in the Ugandan Prime Minister's office, and we were just alone, and we were chatting, and the purpose said, said, and, said, and, and the so frustrated said, who, said, who is there so frustrated me? Who is there to I'm under no illusion that a lot of the people who are here, a lot of the people who are here actually work for agencies, and they actually work for agencies. Incentive and there is to get up the next incentive is to get up the next project which they're It's not to actually be independent. It's not to actually be independent. And the A world and the and the A world and the littered with examples of littered with examples of the best of intentions that go out and say best of intentions that go out and say right we're going to capacity you like it or not. And when you need it or not. And when you need it or not. You're going to get six workshops before breakfast. And that fundamentally has to change. It fundamentally has to change. If this course the way of this discourse away from this is about resources. Where's the resort? Where this is about resolving your money. Whether that's and what, if, when it becomes more of a conversation about what needs are, and what needs are, know about what people know about their situation, know about their and situation. Know about their situation. Know about their and then we can provide capacity, and then we can provide capacity name technology on the basis of that conversation. On the basis of that conversation, intelligently engaged, intelligently engaged. That is, we'll get a sea change. That is, we'll get a sea change, and that is something that we want to bring forward. That is something that we want to bring forward. Very strongly, almost the prerequisites, almost changing gear, in changing gear in adaptation action. I just want to say that I completely agree, um, and part of the reason I joined the organisation I'm in now is because they actually devolved their power. It used to be, I think, a UK led organisation, but they devolved it into um, a federation of 45 members. A federation of 45 members. Everything has to be southern led. Everything has so what to that be means is that we get so what that means our country, is that we get our own country there, and it's very much based people from the country, and it's very much people from the country. They come to us and they say, look, this is they come to us and they say, look, this is what we want to work on. This is how we make this is what we want to work on. And then through that we try to, and then through that we try to access support that. But we can't just come up with an idea and say, we can't just come up with an idea and say, so I think that models like that. So I think that start models like that. Uh, start our ship with it, but uh, there, there aren't that many examples of organizations who have access to work like that. There is also work like that. I think. So well, the problem is if you're going to tax payers, well, the problem is if you're going to tax payers, I suppose, or if you're going to the accounting, or whatever, the human and accounting, and other political things. I would say, I would say, the last two questions, 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 Statement for social security. I think that's statement for social security. I think that's also a core part of the people who do technical and we work a lot of people who do technical and we work a lot of people who do the people who do politics and people who do politics and technical don't often like So, again, back to this, how do we do it? Where's the back to this? How do we do that? Where's the example of the world teams that actually will work together? And you grasp those multi products and you grasp those multi product design human versus state. Those are both political trade offs for intervention. Those are both political trade offs for intervention. Design. And, and the real thing of what the surrounding is on the back to go. It's fine to say it should happen, but, happen, but unless we can think about it's fine to say it should happen, but unless we can think about UK and stuff, that much cost of you building that kind of that much cost of building that kind of capacity, a card of the job, it's been a career, it's their job. We're going to carry on having writing reports, we're going to carry on having writing too many of them. How do we make it seem too many of them? How do we make it seem too many of them? Concrete reforms, you can go to a minister, you can go to a minister and say, this is how you deliver the kind of capacity we all feel is needed to deal with this world where both in and moving in the wrong direction are. So, any suggestions, great for you see. Last yeah. one. Yeah. No, I actually need to exactly something that I wanted to point to. There's nothing that I wanted to point to. There's two things. And one is, let's say, this idea that governments can do all the problem solving, which is, you know, in many situations just not, uh, you know, not possible even if you throw so many budgets to it. I mean, there's many other issues that prevent, let's say, policy change yeah, that we know, you know. And the other thing is indeed 
um, let's say how uh, let's say the importance of bringing this power and influence dimension into the technical work, how difficult this can be, but how also how necessary it is to avoid let's say um, maladaptation and, 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 and making mistakes. Um, uh, at the same time, also uh, in the governments, in the development sector, to allow more risks. Uh, so if you're investing, also to accept, let's say, that if your objective is uh, in the field of security or migration, that, then let's say the typical results frame based frameworks <laughs> uh, of how many farmers do you reach with your agriculture investments or how much water, that you have to think about that also in a, in a, in a different way, more flexible. Uh, and more also fle flexible budget lines uh, that you can change if, if necessary. So, um, yeah, again, this is really something we try to do. Uh, for instance, also the Water uh, Peace and Security Partnership that, that Karen referred to. Uh, this is essentially a data-driven tool, but also the, uh, the idea is to really use it in local context and to refine it also in local context so that it's usable for groups in society affected by water shortages. So we try also, let's say, to to showcase such examples and, uh, and, and uh, uh, hope that others will also make use of such tools once they're developed. Um, and that leads me to one <coughs> uh, final bit, and that's, let's say, from a Klingenau uh, perspective that I really want to thank also the embassy here and also E3G for um, uh, hosting this event and, and co-organizing it with us. Um, great pleasure. I think actually in terms of getting uh, human and state security and getting that right is, is I suspect, easier than we think. Um, we get people from the military embedded in DFID uh, in the stabilization unit and elsewhere. Uh, and the traditional um, wariness, shall we say, lack of understanding between development and military people actually can dissipate quite quickly when they start talking about problems and different ways that they might deal with it and realize that there are some uh, synergies that really can, that are really quite powerful. So that, that's useful, I think. Um, so I think it's probably, I suspect it's easier than people think. Okay, I, hear, I hear the sound of zips. That definitely means people are looking at their watches and looking at their next reception <laughs> when they're going to <coughs> start town. I, um, I suppose my takeaway from the panel is, and I started off by framing this as, yeah, we've been around this loop at least once, actually two or three times conflict and environmental climate. But I do think we're, you know, this next few years is really critical. We've got um, a real impetus from the science and the reality of what's happening on the ground, the things that are really unavoidable and not theoretical PowerPoints, so real things. We have a time and a politics which is moving us towards needing to do more and understand more. And I think we've got some opportunities which the UK and Holland are massive center of in the Sec Gen Summit in COP26 in the G7 in 2021 for the UK with Italy in the G20. There's a kind of period where um, perhaps we can, we've got, uh, we'll get a bit more top-down political will which will give the opportunity to do, and I think the key thing is creative things, not fiddly things with it, and new programs, but really creative institutional reapproaches, yeah, looking quite fundamentally at how we do business. You need top-down political will to permission to do that, but you need people to come in with ideas and boldness and creativity to make that happen from inside and outside government, from bottom up and from top down and in the middle, in fact. So I think it's a very exciting time. I hope we can find a way of keeping the practical level of conversation going, whether through the Global Council or some of the other combinations of organizations here, come and talk afterwards, because yeah, we need to keep on pushing. This is the point, we can't keep on going around, we need to keep on pushing forward because there isn't enough time. Um, but it does feel like there's the seeds of the seeds of, of new and exciting solutions, both political and technical out there. So thanks the panel, please, they've been amazing. And thanks again for the